Welcome back to The Shed. If you're new to The Shed Dogs podcast, we're three old guys who just talk about whatever crosses our mind. And, you know, basically we just goof around and chat and sometimes we pass on useful information. So if you're not new, hi, glad you're back again. We're ready to go with a bunch of stuff for today. Let's start. So the show you're in is Little Red Warrior and his lawyer. Correct. How's it been going? Oh, excellent. Listeners, this is KJ's show that he's doing over in Victoria almost all this month, this month being February. And probably by the time you hear this, it'll be March. And you may or may not have a chance to see the show in Vancouver. It's playing at the York Theatre from March 3rd to March 13th. So have a look there on the web. We'll put a link there. We lost our number one. Did I tell you guys that? No. We lost our little red warrior. Much scrambling going on, of course, and so they got they hired a understudy. So we've been at summer camp for the last week <laughs> because we were supposed to open uh, last week, right? So we have our first audience tomorrow night. So we've had a whole week kind of. Well, he's been the poor guy has been working his little butt off, and he he ran the show last night. So our number one will open here. But he, uh, he uh, fell on stage and he fucked up his back and they only want him... Well, actually, he, the doctor makes a report today. They're pretty sure they only want him to do one show a day so he won't do any matinees and he won't... The two previews, tomorrow night, the next night, our new guy will do it. Wow. So it's been quite the uh, whirlwind over here. So you did like rehearsals for a month or... Did I get that right? I started January 4th. First day of rehearsal was January 4th. And here it is, February 7th. And then we still haven't had an audience. That is crazy talk. But we had um, we had kind of a luxurious rehearsal period to start before the extra week. Uh, so anyway, this is, that's where we are. Is that generally considered a good thing to have extra rehearsal space? Or do actors just find it tedious after a while? Uh, no, I don't know that it, actors would ever find that tedious. In this case, we're the three of us who have been in the show for more than a month are dying for an audience because it's a comedy and y- 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 you sort of want to know where the laughs are and where they're not. And Anyway, we had a couple of staff members last night watch, so that was encouraging. We got some Oh, good, good. New... You've done this show before, right? Nay, nay, nay. This is the... F- the world premiere. They were I'm cool. looking forward so, to it. Yeah. Geez, I'm learning a lot about uh, all sorts of indigenous tidbits, especially historically, and you know who were the good prime ministers and who were the bad prime ministers, and, and like there, there is a sh- just a shit ton of information that most everybody just don't don't know. So it's uh, pretty fascinating. So John A. Macdonald, one of the bad ones. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, no, we, uh, I haven't heard about him. We were talking about uh, Borden. Is it Borden? Yeah. And mm-hmm. just some people, some some prime ministers were allies and some weren't. Some stuff was put on the table, and then the next prime minister just wiped it off the table. Kevin Loring is from Lytton. He's done a series about the history of Canada or the history of British Columbia. The, you guys recall that it was just only last year, sometime I think. Anyway, because he's from the Lytton Band, he knows a lot about the Fraser Canyon War. Uh, little tidbits are like, they would get rattlesnake venom, they would mix it with this yellow flower, he called it, whatever yellow flower, to prevent clotting. They would dip their arrows into that, so that if it hit even uh, somebody's arm, the next day they would be dead. And the, the yellow flower was so that the venom would continue to march on through the body right wow so mm. you, can you imagine what kind of traditional knowledge that is like picking up over the years how this yellow flower is going to make this serum work way better if this is what if this is what we want to use it for anyway like i say i've got all sorts of little tidbits but i don't I'm, maybe i'll look some of that stuff up i think the longest running uh, legal case in canada it has to do with indigenous rights and it is 75 years old and ongoing and th- this is sort of the point of the play is that the courts and the governments just keep kicking it down the road. They they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, well, this should be done. Like something came up just recently that was that's 17 years old and the Supreme Court reiterated that, yes, the in the indigenous 
people have this right and everybody just nods and says yeah yeah they do moving on right moving so that was that was probably the micmac fishery lobster fishery and it's the delgama i think randy delgama guy's name was good one it was a big landmark well, it was a big landmark case in the 80s where they affirmed that the Mi'kmaq had never ceded any of their rights and therefore were entitled to work their fishery whenever they wanted. And that came up again when there was the uh, all the burning of lobster boats and stuff two years ago, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, not because long. Because all the commercial guys were saying, well, they're fishing out of season and, and ruining everything. And the Mi'kmaq guy said, well, we can do whatever we want. And then there came a big dispute about what is a, uh, a subsistence fishery. You know, how much can you take and still call it subsistence? But mixed in with all of that were a Supreme Court decision 17 years ago and another one affirming it again. And that punting you're referring to goes back and forth between politicians who sometimes do and sometimes don't want to touch it. And the Supreme Court that says, well, according to the laws of the land, it's this. And so it is for you to make decisions about whether you change those laws or apply them. And it goes back and forth, back and forth. But the upshot of it, if you're an indigenous person, the upshot of it is nothing ever changes. Yep. Some lawyers make some money and you just continue to get kind of kicked around. You know, lawyers so. make some money, yeah. You're quoting the play all over the place, Skinny. Congratulations. Oh, oh good. Oh, good. That's bleak then. <laughs> bleak. I read, a, but fun. I read a fantastic book about the Namaya Valley, which is up in the Caribou. And basically the natives up there, and I'm just looking it up on Wikipedia right now, it's the Silcotin people. The nat- Silcotin. So, that Silcotin. The, the natives up there basically defeated the uh, government that they the government was coming in for the usual reasons and it's been 15 years or 20 years since i read the book but basically it was for the land and to put them on reservations and all that and they just basically it was a highly defendable area they just (laughs) defended it they never the they never got in there and to this day they're living you know on their their ancestral land so it's pretty cool beautiful book too so the photos i mean the caribou is just an amazing place to see so would really love to get up there but it's as you might imagine it's quite a journey to get in there that's cool i, I think i might have heard of that one but i, I don't it's written know. by t- I terry glavin uh, he used to be a sun oh. uh, reporter yeah. back in the day yeah, yeah. Huh. well my it's goodness teen so cool teen Chilcotin, and I found out that the Okanagan Band, which, I mean, can you, can you claim native rights if you were born there? Even if you're not... What do you mean? If you're non-native and born there? Yeah. No. The Okanagan Band is the Silks. Silks. I learned that. Hmm. I learned that a question mark in um, the written language is a glottal stop, and a number seven is also a glottal stop in a different dialect. Oh, yeah? Just throwing that out there. Okay. <laughs> well, they they look similar. <laughs> sort of, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to just continue inflecting upwards when I see question marks. Question marks? I'm just, I'm not going to go, <laughs> question marks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's okay. good, Skinny. That's good. Yeah, yeah, on fire over here. So, KJ, you've been ah. busy, right? Busy, busy, busy. Go, go, go. Any time for snappers? You got any snappers? You got a list? You got a little notebook you're going to flip out? No, but I got a couple for you. You ready? All right. It's time again for KJ Snappers, wherein our own KJ dog tries to stump the panel with etymological quandaries he stumbled across in his travels, and in which PJ and RJ search deep into their time-addled memories to see if they can piece together the meanings and origins of these terms. So let's play KJ Snappers. I'm so ready. Okay. Now this one, I, uh, I'll um, tell you that I've looked this up because I was kind of intrigued, and I saw it in a Korean translation. So it's a word, an English word, I assume, and the word is uh, scut, S-C-U-T. I know what that is. What, Skinny? 
tell us. Well, make skin skin knows, so I got to guess. All I can yeah. come up with is uh, related to the term scuttle, which is to uh, what is that? To purposely sink a ship or something? Okay, I give up. Skin, what nice. what you got nice. there? It's it's kitchen waste. <laughs> uh, it's waste of some sort. Kitchen waste is scut. I think scuttle butt actually comes from that. That uh, there are scuttles in the ship that are drains for water to go off the ship and out and. Uh, there is the verb scuttle, which means, yeah, to, to deliberately sink. But I think scut is some kind of waste, some kind of stinky, awful crap. No? Yeah? Thumbs up? Well, thumbs down. I th- uh, that's, uh, this is a medical term oh, uh, then in, I'm in wrong. Korean. I'm wrong, but wrong. but, but it, uh, scut is uh, some sort of little rabbit. Oh. No, I did not know that. Is that nice. S-C-U-T? S-C-U-T. And the reference in the medical... Uh, terms was scut is an essential task for a patient that doesn't have to be administered by a doctor. You don't have to be a, a doctor to do it, but it is something that has to be done. So like scut work. Scut work. Which again, scut work, I believe. Are you looking it up? Yep. Yeah, scut work is donkey work, I think. It's what you give, it's the undesirable work. Uh, I believe it uh, uh, I I believe it generally refers to any task that could be completed by an employee without a medical degree. And, yeah, and they're, you they're, know, I found this post, of course, by a doctor saying, scut work is harming residents and their patients. <laughs> 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 and is there any reference on that, uh, well, where you guys are looking to scuttle? That, that they are related? Uh, I don't think so. And I see... Or scuttlebutt, which I want to know about scuttlebutt. I see, there you which go. I see that a scut is the short tail of a hare, rabbit, or deer. Oh, Ooh. short tail, yeah. Um, and there was some um, reference to hop to it. I wonder if that's where scoot comes from, you know? Scoot and hop to it. Scoot, scut, scut, scoot, yeah. That, you're right, Skinny. That's what the reference was way off on all of that. I didn't hear anything in any of the lookups about my guess, so that was completely wrong, I think. Who knew? Good. Okay, good. the, the uh, only other one, and I just saw this yesterday, it's the phrase part and parcel. Hmm. Skinny, tell us about that one. I don't know where that comes from, actually. I don't have any idea if I... I don't even have a ready guess. What does it mean? Yeah, probably. exactly. Because skin's, you know, skin has such an inherent understanding of a lot of these terms. Like it's just built into them. And I, I'm sure that they show up in <laughs> Horatio Alger stories or whatever he used mm-hmm. to read. Hornblower. Hornblower. That's Horatio it. Hornblower stories. And so he's just like, he's straight to, oh, I wonder where that came from. Of course, everybody knows what that means. But <laughs> well, part and parcel means it's an integral part of something. It is. You know, like the pistons, uh, the, the health of your piston is part and parcel to the health of your engine. If your piston is unhealthy, your engine is also unhealthy. It's inseparable from the larger thing. See, it's I always thought it was part engine. and parcel, but it's part in parcel. Oh, I, didn't know I was, yeah, I was certain it was part Same. and parcel. Same. I oh, my goodness. Yes, yeah, so I, uh, I read it on some, just yesterday, I believe, and I thought, oh, I didn't know it was that. I, I wonder where it comes from, though, because I just no <laughs> idea. Okay, well, Merriam-Webster gives it as part and parcel, so it's probably, oh. but that's probably because over time it has migrated. I think I saw it on a CBC News something. Well, I saw something uh it might not be well served here in this medium but you know the thumbs up gesture yep. mm-hmm. where you listeners you clench your fist and then stick your thumb straight up in the air thumbs up while i was watching some guy talking about the longbow at edge court could it pierce air armor and i'd you know because this is how i spend my days but <laughs> the guy's shooting all these arrows he's shooting and shooting and shooting and he says, well, the string's getting a little slack. And he sticks the bottom of his fist on the place where the arrow rests on the bow when you're shooting. Yeah. And he sticks his thumb up and his thumb extends past where the string is. So his string has become slack. So it's not standing up as high above the bow as it normally should. So he restrings his bow and he puts his fist back in there again with his thumb sticking up and lo we see that the string passes just over the tip of his thumb and he says there see i'm all jacked up 
that's where the expression comes from. I'm all jacked up, and he gives a thumbs up as he says it. And I've never heard that expression, but I was wondering, in general, whether that's where thumbs up comes from. Oh, I always thought that thumbs up was put your th- the the pilots put their thumb up to block out the sun. That's when they're um, that sounds... like fighter pilots in the, f- the Second World War or the First World War, maybe. I don't know, maybe. I did end up going down a little path with the uh, live or die symbols in ancient Rome and, and whether that's where it comes from. And it, it doesn't seem it like it's that particular gesture. The way we do it in the movies isn't really very similar to how they did it in Rome, I don't think. They they'd press their thumb or something. I don't know. Anyway, just a little thing. And, and like I say, this whole thing might go because... It's kind of hard to visualize the gesture if you don't. Oh, let's put little pictures, uh, diagrams. And then, of course, from Agincourt also was the middle finger, right? I did not know that one. Oh, the French used to give, uh, or whoever, the English gave it to the French, or the French gave it to the English, they gave them the middle finger because that was a threat that they, I don't know if they did this, but they threatened oh. to capture all the archers and chop off their middle finger so that they couldn't they couldn't uh, arch oh. correctly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I know I think that comes from at least Agincourt, if not earlier. Well, yeah. uh, Wikipedia says uh, back Oops. on the thumbs up here. The uh, exact source of the thumb gesture is obscure. A number of origins have been proposed. Uh, Carlton S. Kuhn, having observed Barbary apes in Gibraltar using the gesture, hypothesized that it is a mutual celebration of having opposable thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> Look what we that got. Guy, that guy didn't have a lot of success selling his hypotheses, I'm uh, going to cr- <laughs> Critics have suggested, however, that the apes may be simply imitating humans. Yeah. Apes seem to do that quite a bit, don't they? <laughs> and Imitating? vice versa, don't they? Yeah. yeah. Don't we imitate ape, apes be, quite a bit? We, Eyebrow flashing think, and stuff well, like we're, that. Well, we're aping them all the time, I think. <laughs> Till Thursday! <laughs> uh, I just Let me see. Um, here's another one. Are we done with that? Yeah. Um, do What skinny, you're going to know this one. I didn't know Scott. Hobson's Choice. Oh, yeah. RJ will know this. I, I don't know this. I believe this is a, it's, it's a, it's a lose-lose, I think. Yeah. I think you're, it's, it's a bad thing and a worse thing. You get a Hobson's Choice is unpleasant no matter how. Our kids like figured that. this out a long time ago. And I think most kids are pretty quick to figure this out. You know, it's like when you need them to do something you, that they simply don't want to do, you give them the choice of two different ways of doing it. You know, <laughs> the truth is yeah. they're both bad choices, but you've given that to give the person the illusion of choice. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. No, but is it that though? Is it too bad? Like, would you rather freeze to death or burn to death? Yeah. Oh. Is it spelled H O B S O N? Yeah. And yeah. It's uh, an, appa- it. an apparently free choice when there is no real alternative. It's the necessity of accepting one of two or more equally objectionable alternatives. And so, wh- what's the source? Oh, like why is it called Hobson's? Like, w- was it a li- I thought it was a literary reference. That Thomas Hobson worked as a licensed carrier of passengers, letters, and parcels between Cambridge and London, England. He kept horses for the purpose. This is in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. He rented the horses to university students when he wasn't using them. Of course, the students always wanted their favorite mounts, and consequently, a few of Hobson's horses became overworked. To correct the situation, Hobson began a strict rotation system, giving each customer the choice of taking the horse nearest the stable door or none at all. This rule became known as Hobson's (laughs) choice, and soon people were using that term to mean no choice at all. You know, because basically they need a horse. So his the choice he offers them is that shitty horse that's just a uh, hundred kilometer or hundred feet from you, or no horse at all. Or nothing. So they got to they got to take the lousy horse. Man, I would have never guessed that. I would have thought it was some philosopher writing in the late seventeen hundreds that 
proposed that life is a series of dismal choices or something. I would have never thought yeah. of that. I thought it was a... That's because you were thinking of Thomas Hobbes. Yeah, well, I knew that, but I just thought there might have been another guy named Hobbes' son. Yeah. You know, like I, I knew that that's why it came to my head, that name, but yeah. I actually thought... Well, I actually thought it was some, from some Irish playwright or something. So what's the reference uh, uh, in, in our piece... I think she says Hobzinian something, and then she yells, Leviathan, Leviathan. <laughs> Anything, Skin? No. Okay, that's sure that's a literary reference. She calls it a Hobbesian nightmare, and then she yells, we're living in some sort of Hobbesian nightmare, she says. Leviathan, Leviathan. <laughs> I, no, any, nothing, no, Hobbes, me neither. At least we're talking about the philosopher. Yeah, for there. sure, yeah. Oh, that's a philosopher named Hobbesian? Well, no, Hobbes, Hobbes, you know... Hobbes. Oh, 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 okay, okay. But you know, guys, Hobbes is best known for his 1651 book, Leviathan. <laughs> oh, there you oh, go. go. Yay. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> RJ, nice work. Just pulled that from the back of your mind somewhere. I can't believe <laughs> yeah, that. For sure. There's a lot <laughs> rattling around in that big, empty, yeah. cavernous space. <laughs> echo, echo. Well done, RJ. Yeah, that's good. I think that's it for... For the Snappers this week, thanks for joining us, listeners. And we'll be back next week with something even more exciting. So, uh, you guys want to do listener mail? Yeah. Yes, I do. Ooh, we got great mail. Sandra from New Westminster, first-time writer, says, Hey, guys. Pat, glad to hear you had a mild case if you had to catch it. I've heard of more horror stories in my circle than mild cases, so I'm glad you came through it without too much trouble. So can I just interrupt because I just want everybody to know that we're talking about COVID, not <laughs> anything else you might be thinking of. Uh, COVID, that's what that was. God, that's itchy. <laughs> she says, I agree that Don't Look Up was really good, but I had a bit of a different take on it. I felt the title itself pointed to the premise of the story. It was all about what happens when you don't consider ethics and qualifications of the individuals you elect into office. That's actually quite uh, quite interesting take. Um, she says, what happens to society and humanity when there is incompetent, self-servicing, power-hungry leadership? I thought it was a black comedy 100% reflecting the Donald Trump presidency. The climate change factor was just a vehicle to put it in current context. The media is the ugly cousin of leadership. The other movie that I was reminded of was Dr. Strangelove, a commentary on current politics, current social issues, all wrapped in a thick blanket of comedy. I enjoy the movie reviews. Keep them coming. So that's great. I thought that was a pretty good letter, and I agree with all of it, and I do like the ugly cousin of leadership. I just thought, oh, geez, that's pretty good. That's a quotable quote, you know? I had a chance to watch Don't Look Up Again the other day because uh, Glenn uh, Victoria got around to watching it and really enjoyed it. I watched it again and it was even better than the first time. It just It's just one of those kind of movies. It really is so well done that you don't go, oh, I've already seen this scene. I want to get past it. No, you just like you just soak it in. Fantastic show. Mm, well, that's good to and, know. Uh, good to know. Worth a second view. You don't hear that. I heard well. an interview with the writer of Don't Look Up just last night. It was totally a hundred percent about uh, climate change. I'm sure that there were uh, these other factors to it, but his number one motivation was that climate change should be the only issue that we're talking about. So he was just going to go, you know. The media is simply not talking about it. Politicians are not talking about it near as much as they should. There shouldn't be just an issue in the Vancouver Sun. Every couple of weeks, there'll be an article on the front page. It should be on every front page is, is his point. I think that's a pretty good point. There's a bunch of issues like that, actually. But, but listeners, if you, uh, if, you, if you do watch Don't Look Up, make sure you watch after the end of the credits. It's just an amazing scene. And I had forgotten about it too, but uh, Glenn pointed it out and I watched it again. And yeah, yeah. So, so the credits, the main credits start with all the big actors and they're fantastic to watch too, because each actor, as their name shows up, some aspect of their role shows up with them. Like the, uh, 
Ariana Grande, when her name shows up, this bejeweled microphone is there because she's a singer, right? Like, so every one of those is really beautifully done. Uh, and then they have the uh, final scene of what really happens on the planet that they've fled to. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, good. I did. I was thinking, did I miss it? No, yeah, I, yeah. I saw it. That was a really cool scene. Good. Yes, do watch that if you're watching. Yeah. Yeah. She goes on to provide a link to a video, and she says, This video made me realize I hadn't laughed this hard since before COVID. So I'm sending it your way, hoping you will enjoy it as much as I did. If you have an extra $212 or higher that you want to spend at Amazon, you can enjoy it live at home. And then so she sends us a link, and we will post that link in the show notes. Just leave it to our listeners. Made me laugh, but leave it to our listeners. All right. And she closes with congrats on your 131st episode. I hope there is cake for the 150th. Sandra from New West. Nice. I hope there's cake for the 133rd, actually. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> I hope it's Okay, there well, now. you know, I'll tell you. How about, guys, I can commit to making us a cake right now for the 150th. Oh, no, we're recording. Yeah. <laughs> Did you not now, Rich? To Thursday, <laughs> I can come, and we'll uh, and we'll do that in the shed. It's a marvelous cake, but uh, in case you have something against this, it's a uh, orange cake with chocolate frosting. Would that work for you? Love it. I love it. Okay. Love it. Okay. And mm. you'll be pleased to note. I mean, it hasn't happened yet, but because I am smoking outdoors in Victoria. The future of the shed will be a non-smoking area. <laughs> is that your, is that How? your plan? Yeah, I'm going to smoke outdoors at home. How will you manage that? I step out to the door. Wow! And how come you're doing this? Is this just for your guests, or well, because you don't want to? Well, because it's, I've cut my budget in half by smoking outdoors. Oh. You know, and if you talk about. Uh, like two hundred dollars every five days, that adds Holy up. Holy smokes, does that ever? Is that what it is these days? Wow, pretty close. Did not know that. So I've I've almost cut that in half. That's wild. Just by sort of inconvenience. Yeah, yeah. Is it making it more enjoyable? No, I like to sit down. I'm I'm usually standing if I'm outside. I like to sit down and <laughs> have nine in a row with my coffee and some movie, right? But um, last night. I ran out of smokes, and I uh, so I went to Seven Eleven. I was just going to get two packs because I had a, sort of half a carton at home, and I thought, oh well, I'm here. Why don't I just get a carton? So we're outside in front of the theater, and some guy comes up and he says, "You guys know where I can buy some smokes?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> for twenty dollars, I can." Yeah, really, really. That's what I felt That's right. like too. Have you ever considered seeking out a contraband source, a bootleg smokes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can go down to uh, uh, the downtown east side and get them for five bucks. Now, are they real, like, commercial cigarettes, or are these... No. Okay. No, they're they're uh, uh, native brands. Oh, really? Really? Wow. So five bucks for a pack. Yep. And what does a pack cost you in the store these days? I would pay a hun- uh, $18.75. Wow. For a pack of cigarettes, so things have changed. Days so about ninety, about ninety Whoa. cents a smoke, something like that. Wow, that yeah, I was going to say, is that a pack of twenty or twenty-five? Yeah, 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 wow. yeah, ninety cents a smoke. Yeah, I haven't checked in on no. the cost of cigarettes in quite a long time. I do recall, I do recall wow. from my youth, they were sixty cents a pack in high school. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, I remember that hunts shaking my head slowly over them getting to about five bucks a pack. I just thought, and that's where my whole thing stopped i still have that earmarked in my head someplace oh they're probably like six dollars now well i think I, I don't know when this started but for the last maybe three years or five years they go up 50 cents a pack every three months yeah it's wow. by from by the it's government. almost all tax right yeah wow well so thank you smokers for rebuilding the coca no kidding. for us i appreciate that that's huge wow I guess they get, they're probably going to start doing the same thing with alcohol. Probably. They have just well, because there it's is a syntax, st- right? Yeah, but I think there is on There's a lot. It doesn't it doesn't seem to march up like. Um, well, it, that's what I was referring to. There's a ton of tax on alcohol yeah. right now, absolutely. Yeah, because it is a syntax. 
I wonder if they'll start just putting the screws to it like that because just jack it up every three months. I mean, I don't want to be the bad news guy, but alcohol is extremely bad for your health, right? It's it's of course. basically a cancer agent for sure, which people don't think about too much because you think more about the liver and stuff. But But because in society it's not frowned and looked down upon then the smoking tax is way, way higher as a percentage than alcohol. But you can look at uh, smoking um, pretty specifically as far as medical a medical condition and the fallout of that is concerned as compared to alcohol. Alcohol is sort of spread over all sorts of different right, areas. Right, right. Yeah, smoking is... Yeah. The, dreaded, the dreaded comorbidity arguments. The other thing with alcohol is, I guess, if you drink alcohol in a public place like a restaurant, the person next to you is not going to suffer the consequences. Right. That's Whereas true. Whereas with smoking, they, they yep. would. But still, you, you know, I do wonder when they're going to get around to applying that same escalating tax to alcohol because it's pretty damaging. On, uh, on episode 131, Lee of Courtney says, Hi, dogs. You packed a lot into 39 minutes. Nice editing, PJ. Good job. Thank Regarding you. the part about visualization... I do think there's a lot to it, although I've never used it for a parking spot. But then in Courtney, it's not really much of an issue to find one. But way back when I was playing tennis out of the North Shore Winter Club, a coach I had used visualization a lot. For example, see the net as six inches high, and as there, there is no way you're going to hit it. Your ball is always going to sail over. It actually worked. And yeah, I, I know in foosball, they talk about visualization all the time, and um, it's probably every sport, you know, visualize a yeah. particular shot as a way of practicing it. You don't have yeah. to be near a table. You can just visualize it over and over and your shot gets better just from that. Yeah. Hasn't worked for me in hockey. I constantly visualize picking that top corner on the breakaway. <laughs> yeah. Work out that way. It's usually right in the crest. Just <laughs> nailed him right in the crest. If only that was a goal, <laughs> I'd be a top scorer. Yeah, it hasn't guy. worked for me either. I constantly visualize thousands of fans uh, with that, you know, <laughs> cheering uh, on, yeah, their feet, on their feet, waving yeah. banners. It just doesn't seem stuff. to improve my game much. <laughs> She says, RJ mentioned being the Ricardo series with Nicole Kidman. Although you already know my feelings on taking historical fiction too much to heart, this one actually has a lot of reality to it. As one of the world's biggest classic old Hollywood fans, I, of course, watch a lot of TCM on TV, and that led me to listen to the TCM podcast called The Plot Thickens. The third season is just wrapping up, and it was all about Lucille Ball from birth to death. That actually sounds quite interesting. Yeah, that's what I felt when she I She says, that. fascinating, as was her first husband, Desi Arnaz. Both, of course, much, much more than we ever saw portrayed on the TV series. Anyway, the in-depth research for that podcast does parallel the Being the Ricardos portrayal a fair bit. Well, that sounds really good. I mean, after listening to the Shed Dogs, then consider listening to the plot thickens. <laughs> Also enjoyed the segment with Pat talk, talking about those crazy planes that were developed and yet barely were used. And sometimes those that were used came to a very bad end. I can understand, sort of, how the airplane maker could get the first test pilot, but it's beyond me how they'd get a second one. <laughs> <laughs> and there's just an endless supply of those planes, too. They really tried a lot of crazy stuff in between about 1910 and about 1950. Just really a lot. And then she says, finally, I'm sorry to hear PJ got COVID, but very glad to hear it was a mild case and that there are no lingering effects. Also, one last thing. It wasn't Bach who went deaf. That was Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> All three of us just go, yep. Yep. Uh, go to the do, music do, do, podcast do. then if you're going to be that do, way. Do, do, I do, think do. we should have known, though. I don't know. Yes. I should have I laughed that. when I saw that, though. Just doopy doopy yeah. doop, just like I say. Just didn't even, <laughs> didn't even cross she my says, mind. Like, One of those famous guys was deaf. That's about all as far we as We know a lot of things here on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The key is to state them as though they're irrefutable fact. That's the she key. says, I guess you couldn't hear me calling out to you a few times from the treadmill <laughs> run as I was listening. <laughs> yeah. And thank you, Lee. 
And finally, we got uh, this is from uh, Squarespace. Uh, it says your Squarespace website subscription is about to renew. As a reminder, so February 18th. It's about yes. to renew? Wow, yeah. that's awesome. I'm glad they're not charging us anything. I thought we would have to pay or else it would expire. <laughs> yeah, wow. they go on. <laughs> life, is, life is sweet. $144 US. If you want to just give us money, that would be great. There'd be the burden of knowing what to do with it. I think the burden would be suddenly feeling like we owe something to our listeners. I feel we do owe something. That kind of stress causes heart attacks. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) Who needs it? We owe the presentation of indifference to our users. That's what we owe them. We we owe them the idea that we just find this a pleasant lark and don't invest hours and hours and hours, stay up late, occasional crying fits, all that kind of stuff. (laughs) We had another listener mail from Haley of Montreal. Mm Mm-hmm. This was also on episode 131, Humble Dogs, from Haley of Montreal. At any rate, she says, RJ is the different one. In my experience, most people can visualize a photo or image memory when prompted. So she's referring to your inability to visualize. And then she also says, some listeners are tired of Paul McCartney references. (laughs) Good episode. Thanks. All right. So, of course, in my many conversations with her since then, I've been dropping as many Paul McCartney references as I can possibly manage about it. You know, Paul McCartney was interested in steam cars. Why, was there a lot in in 131? No, but when that special came out, it was all over social media, and then we did talk about it, and uh, we, I believe, are intent upon talking about it more, too. Just, Just as a warning to Haley of Montreal, probably going to get worse before it gets better on this podcast so <laughs> and that's listener mail but i just did see a minute ago a falcon go by whoa from my perch that's pretty nice that's the first one see what happens when you talk about paul mccartney yeah. nature votes yes so that's kj it's uh disney plus.com that's where you go to to watch that you just have to figure out what your user id and password is but if you're lucky they've, yeah. they've been cached on your laptop there we have we sort of have common passwords in the family. <laughs> there you go. Cracks me up. Yeah, I, I was thinking the other day that Netflix, for sure, I think they like it when you share passwords amongst the family because they have that automatic limiter anyway. You can only have so many connections at the same time. Kind of forces right. you up to the higher one. And then, like in our case, I'd be fine just to discontinue Netflix for a while, you know, because it's easy to do. You could just say, stop me, and then two months later, you can start it back up again. You know, we won't ever discontinue that because both of our kids use it. And mm. it's kind of dorky to tell your kids, oh, I'm trying to save sixteen fifty a month. <laughs> you know, like, so you just keep it on, right? Whereas we a do... A bag of smokes is worth more than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Wow. So, wow. wh- whereas with Disney yeah. Plus, we never gave them the password, so we just turned it back off when we were done. And uh, <laughs> Amazon Prime, we actually, I could have sworn I disconnected it, but we're still on it. So, n- this time I'm going to take a screenshot when we disconnect just to make sure. Hey, I had something I wanted to talk about because we have an actual actor in our midst who I expect to stand up for his brethren and sistern on this issue. And it was... Yikes. I chanced the other day, actually at Haley of Montreal's recommendation, to watch Terminator Dark Future, which is the latest on Netflix, since we're talking about that, installment in the Terminator franchise. I did the same thing. I said to somebody in the cast, I said... Is there a Terminator Dark... What is it? Dark what? Dark Future. Dark Future. And they said, yes, there is. And so I looked at it. Go on, Skin. Sorry to interrupt. Well, I, I watched it because, you know, why would I not? You know things are going to get blowed up real good. But <laughs> many listeners, you know, of the tens of thousands, there's a couple of hundred are probably pretty tired of hearing me talk smack about Kanunu. So I'm not <laughs> going to do that because he's not in this movie. And neither is Nicolas Cage, which is remarkable because i'm going to give this movie a strongly negative review that is in fact just don't watch it don't even go find out how bad it is just don't watch it and in particular linda hamilton is yes i agree dreadful. oh my goodness so <laughs> in the simpsons crusty endorses a bunch of really terrible products and bart 
<laughs> Bart, who loves Krusty, t- calls him out on it. And Krusty says, you know, they backed a dump truck full of money up to my house. What was I going to do? I get that. Like, for $10 bucks, there's not much I wouldn't do in a, in a movie. So I understand. I also understand you've got a director who is telling you to go a certain way with your character, to project certain ideas through your character, and you've got a writer who's giving you words that you must say. But, oh my goodness, just awful. Even within those constraints, I felt she was just awful. And then you think... <laughs> If you're a reasonably successful actor, at what point do you just say no? Linda, we want you to play the same character that you played in the first of this whole series, now grown old, but strangely still highly combative and improbably combative and just awful. How about it? <laughs> and she doesn't say, you know what, I'm good. I'm just not going to do it. No. She says, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, I'll do that part. <laughs> just Schwarzenegger is better than her. Oh, or Arnold, just Oscar material. Everybody in that movie was Oscar I got a material third of the way through it, Skinny, and oh. I could not stomach anymore. It just was awful. So the question for you, KJ, as an actor, brethren and cistern, does there come a point when no amount of money is enough or not? Well, what do you think? No, I think no. No, that point never arrives. But I just think it should. There should be some kind of law passed. If we can get away with... I, so this I, is Terminator Dark there, Fate you're talking about. <laughs> oh, sorry, Dark Fate. Dark Future. Oh, sorry. Dark... I, I was... You know, it's. I've already had some counseling to try to get it out of my head, and it's only been part of Oh, I'm looking at the Wikipedia... Or, sorry, the Metacritic page for Terminator Dark Fate. And uh, up comes a trailer with Linda Hamilton, and she looks just like she's having a real problem acting there. Like, it's, oh, even in the trailer. Yeah, well, that is that's the oh. the image that I sent you guys is the uh, it's that's the still trailer, yeah. it's the still frame from the trailer. But uh, on just... Metacritic, it actually has a medium score, a fifty four. Now, you know, high end movies on Metacritic, they're like eighty five or whatever, and often as you know, those high end movies are kinda hard to watch. And so, you know, like if we're looking for an action movie, then fifty four is sweet spot for a Metacritic. Uh so I thought, wow, if it's rated that high and PJ says it's terribly terrible, generous. I'll bet you the user score is low. And so, sure enough, the, the, the reviewers give it uh, 54 out of 100 on average. Users give it 3.9 out of 10. So that's interesting. That's very, very rare when reviewers actually like something more than the audience. That's uh, mm-hmm. not very common. Yeah. So they must have been doing homage. All their reviews used the word homage, and they used franchise, and they used a whole bunch of... They got all arty on it which is terribly, horribly ironic. It just, honestly, they did a bunch of clever references to taglines of the past. At one point, Arnold picks up his dark wraparound shades and he puts them down again because he's not that Terminator. Well, the Wall Street Journal says the plot makes no sense. Time travel as multiverse data. Worse still, it renders meaningless the struggles that gave the first two films of the franchise an epic dimension. I didn't even bother to invest in anything to do with the plot and the time travel aspects and all that. I just couldn't get past Linda. The rap says, the film brings the tale of the first two films to a satisfying conclusion. Ooh. There you go. Well, I got to believe that the satisfaction is that we believe it is concluded at this point. There will be no more of this stuff. Just, I hope that's what it means. Okay. Oh, I, was, I was shocked, honestly. Like, you really do think, even within all the constraints I talked about, you still think, I think she could have done something. I think she could have had some lines read differently. Just anything. No, it's not plausible for a 75-year-old woman to jump off a 12-foot platform and immediately just run away. No, none of that. Just, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Come to the end of another pleasant session in the virtual shed. We hope you enjoyed yourself as much as we did. 
We hope you didn't find anything too objectionable or really idiotically wrong, as occasionally happens. If either of those things did turn out to be the case here, make sure and let us know, because we're always happy to hear from you, even if what you say isn't necessarily what we love to hear. Just don't write in saying you agree with Rich. That's all I ask. If you are going to do that, I don't know what, send a text or something. Do something way less permanent than that. In the meantime, take care of yourselves. Keep on keeping on. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, those are pretty rare when people uh, say stuff that they agree with me. But when it does happen, it gives me a nice little jolt of endorphins. Makes me feel good. <laughs> well, you know, we're all about keeping your endorphin supply Thank fresh. You. Thank okay, you. That's, yeah. that's what we're here for.